everybody uh, to the LCC speaker series. This session will be recorded and it will be made available at the LCC speaker series website. Uh, Dr. Ken Hyland will deliver today's talk titled Options for Teaching Writing, Text, Writer and Reader Orientations. Uh, Dr. Ken Hyland is an honorary professor at the University of East Anglia. Uh, previously, he was a professor at University College London, uh, University of East Anglia and University of Hong Kong. He's best known for his research on writing and academic discourse and is a prolific writer. He has published 285 articles and 29 books, a collection of articles in the essential Highland, and he has uh, 74,000 citations on Google Scholar. In addition, he was founding co-editor of the Journal of English for Academic Purposes and co-editor of Applied Linguistics. I'd now like to invite him to deliver his talk. Ken, okay. would you like to go ahead and share your slides? Yeah, I would. Thank you, Siddhartha, for inviting me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Let me just set my screen up. Um, oops, let's go back. Okay, have you got that? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, anyway, again, thanks for coming. And um, I wanna talk about uh, teaching writing um, because this is perhaps the most difficult skill for students to acquire and probably the most difficult for teachers to teach. It's also one of the few things I know anything about. So um, uh, writing it is. I, I plan to present the key approaches to writing as different options, although it's possible to mix and match uh, to some extent. Now you're gonna be familiar with, with, with uh, some of this, um, but I hope it raises issues for you and uh, helps you to reflect on what it is you do in your own uh, classroom. Now, <clears throat> now each um, focus assumes a different idea about writing and implies different teaching methods. So the first approach concentrates on the products of writing by examining texts. The second focuses on the writer and the processes used to create texts. And the third approach emphasizes the role that readers play in writing, showing how writers think about an audience uh, in creating texts. Now, this is all very broad, but I think it's a useful way of um, discussing and evaluating some of the research and how it feeds into uh, classrooms. First of all, then, um, we have text-oriented um, approaches. These see writing as an outcome, the words on a page or on a screen. So this is writing as a noun rather than as a verb. And there are two broad approaches to looking at text because we can either see them as objects or as discourse. Now, seeing text as objects means understanding writing as the application of rules. So writing is a thing independent of any writers, readers, or context. And learning to write, or learning to become a good writer, is largely a matter of knowing grammar. So this is what we tend to think of as a product approach. This view sees writing as the arrangement of words, clauses, or sentences. And students can be taught to say exactly what they mean by putting these together effectively. In the writing classroom, teachers emphasize language structures, often in these four stages. First of all, there's some kind of familiarization where students uh, look at a text to understand its grammar and vocabulary. Then there's controlled writing, where they manipulate fixed patterns, perhaps uh, using um, uh, substitution tables, um, gap filling. And then there's guided writing, where they imitate model texts, completing texts, writing parallel texts. And then finally, learners get to use the patterns that they've uh, developed to write an essay, a letter or whatever. 
Now, this has been a major classroom approach for many years, but it draws on the rather old fashioned and discredited idea that meaning is contained in the message, that we transfer ideas from one mind to another using language. Now this lies, this idea lies behind uh, the conduit metaphor of language. Basically this says that, um, so the lady with the dark hair has an idea, she puts it into words in the box, sends it through the conduit, which here is, is writing. The lady with the fair hair uh, reads the words and has exactly the same idea um, as the lady with the dark hair. So meanings correspond with words and writing is transparent in reflecting meaning rather than constructing them. So meanings can be written down and understood by anyone with the right encoding and decoding skills. A text says everything that needs to be said. There are no conflicts of interest, no reader positions, no different understandings. We all see things in the same way and, and life is wonderful. But this doesn't make sense, of course, because <clears throat> accuracy is just one feature of good writing. And on its own, it doesn't, it doesn't make communication. And this is how lawyers make their money. They, they dispute and pick over the most explicitly written contracts and documents. So our goal as writing teachers can never be just training students in accuracy because all texts include what writers assume their readers will know and how they're going to use the text. The writer's problem then is not to make everything explicit but to make it, make it explicit for um, particular readers, balancing what needs to be said against what can be assumed. So this model then um, sees text as sort of independent of any real life users and adopting it as a teaching approach can mislead students into thinking that they just need to write accurately to be effective. Now, the second text approach to, is to see them as, as discourse, the way that we use language to communicate to achieve purposes in particular situations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here, the writer is seen as having certain goals and intentions, and that the ways we write are resources to accomplish these goals. So instead of forms being independent of context, a discourse approach sees them as located in social actions. Teachers try to see the ways that texts actually work as communication by linking language forms to uh, the purposes for which they're being used and the context in which they're used. So a key idea here, of course, is out of genre, um, a term for, for grouping texts together. We know immediately, for example, if a text is a recipe, a joke, a, a, a blog post or, or a love letter, and we can respond to it and perhaps write a similar one if we need to. We all have a, a, a repertoire of these uh, responses that we can call up in, in familiar situations, and we learn new ones as we need them. So genre reminds us that we, when we write, we follow conventions for organizing messages because we want our reader to recognize our purpose. So this is rather like the introduction body conclusion um, pattern that we learned to structure our essays uh, like at, back at school all those years ago, um, or the problem solution pattern, which organizes narratives. So here, the text usually opens with a contextualizing move, which introduces the players and the situation. Then a problem is introduced for the participants. This is followed by their response to the problem. And then finally, there's an evaluation of the response. So was it successful? So genre approaches <clears throat> describe the stages, which help writers to set out uh, their thoughts in ways that readers can easily follow. All genres have a social purpose and the, um, the goal, main goal of a narrative, of course, is to entertain through, through storytelling. And this is achieved through fairly conventional steps. So this is why Jim Martin calls genre a staged goal-oriented activity. Um, 
we can't achieve our goal all at once in one go. So we work towards it in stages. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of this from, uh, from classrooms. Um, first of all, um, the explanation. Now an explanation describes a process like um, the water cycle or how something works, a light bulb. <clears throat> This is an example from a primary school um, L1 student about um, uh, hibernation. And um, it's structured as uh, a general straight statement introducing the topic, and then a series of logical steps explaining how or why it occurs. They're usually written um, with uh, generalized non-human participants in the timeless present, a lot of temporal sequence connectors, next, then, after that, causal connectives, because, therefore, and a lot of action verbs, things, things happen. Instructions, on the other hand, are written to describe how something should be done. So they usually consist of uh, a statement about what's to be achieved, so how to make banana muffins, then there's a list of materials and equipment needed to achieve the goal, a series of sequence steps towards the goal, and um, diagrams, illustrations, and so on. Um, I, I should warn you not to make notes of this, um, of this recipe. It, it's not an authentic text. I made it up and I don't know anything about cooking, so you'll get a stomachache if you eat this. Um, but they are they do look like this, and they're written generally in chronological order, very direct, simple, present, or imperative. Um, they focus on, on general human groups rather than individuals, short, simple sentences, a lot of signposting words for uh, to indicate the sequence, and again, um, action verbs, things happen. So genres encourages, uh, encourage us to look for patterns to see how meanings are created through um, conventional structures. But what does this look like in the classroom? Well, for one thing, it means attending to grammar. But this is not the um, traditional grammar of the writing as object approach. Here, grammar is a resource for producing text. And a knowledge of grammar then shifts writing from what is implicit and hidden to something that is conscious and explicit so that students can use the grammar to write effectively. Now in class, this often involves getting students to notice, reflect on, and then use writing conventions to help them produce well-formed and appropriate texts. And one approach widely used in Australia is the teaching learning cycle. And you may have seen this um, before. And essentially, the cycle helps us to plan classroom activities by showing genre learning as a series of linked stages, which support learners towards understanding text. Now, the key stages then are, first of all, understanding the uh, purpose of the genre and the settings where it's used. So how does it fit into workplace, social, academic situations? Who writes it? with whom, who for, um, why, what's the relationship between the writer and the reader? Is it uh, uh, formal or informal? Is it, um, uh, are there status or power differences and so on? So we look to see, um, we look at a text to see what writers are trying to do in a particular context. The second stage involves modeling the genre, analyzing it to reveal its stages and its key features. So what are the main tenses, uh, themes, what kind of vocabulary does it use and so on. And so here students might get, uh, might be asked to uh, sequence or label text stages or, or reorganize scramble paragraphs. A third stage involves the joint construction of the genre through guided teacher supported practice. So maybe students write a, a parallel text or work in small groups on, a, um, on, a, on a, a structured piece of writing. Fourth is independent writing where students work alone, monitored by the teacher. 
And then finally, the teacher relates what's been um, learned to other genres and contexts. So comparing with other genres that they've already learned or um, seeing how it's linked to uh, other texts in a given context. So each stage has a different purpose and draws on different um, uh, classroom activities. The thing is that students can enter the cycle at any stage, depending on what they already know about the genre, and genres can be recycled at more advanced levels of expression. The cycle also provides students with scaffolded learning. So supporting them through what Zygotsky calls on the right there, the zone of proximal development. So the gap between students' current and potential um, uh, performance. So as we move around the circle, direct teacher instruction is reduced and students gradually get more confidence to learn the genre um, on their own. So their autonomy um, increases as they gain greater control over the genre. Now, genre teaching has been criticized for stifling creativity, imposing models on students. And obviously there are risks here as teachers might teach uh, genres as a kind of recipe. So the students get the idea that they just need to to pour their own content into ready-made moulds. But I don't think there's any reason why genres, why providing students with an understanding of discourse should be any more prescriptive than, um, say, providing them with a description of the clause or, or steps in a writing uh, process. The key point is that genres do constrain us. Uh, once we accept that our goals are best served by writing, say, a, a blog post, or a lab report, then we're gonna write within expected patterns. The genre doesn't dictate what we write um, or determine how we write it. It enables choices to be made because meaning comes from choosing some choices rather than others. It's that, it's that um, difference that readers can observe that creates the meaning. So genre theorists, suggest that uh, a teacher who understands how texts are typically structured, understood and used, is in a better position to uh, intervene successfully in the writing development of his or her students. Now, the second broad approach uh, focuses on the writer rather than on the text. So interest here is on what good writers do um, when they write, so that we can teach these methods to uh, second language students. So writing is seen as a, a process through which we discover and, and reformulate our ideas as we write. So this is more of a problem solving activity than an act of communication. How people approach writing um, a writing task as, as a, and solve it as a problem. So to explain how writers solve this problem, process theorists draw on the tools of cognitive psychology um, and artificial intelligence. So in this model, there's a, um, there's a memory, a central processing unit, problem solving programs and flow charts. Now this flow chart of the, of the process is, is probably well known to, to everybody here. It shows that writers don't create texts by thinking, writing, editing, but they keep jumping between these different stages. So the, the, the diagram suggests and process tells us that um, writers have goals and that they plan extensively, often through internet searches, note-taking and so on. That writing is constantly revised, often in our heads before any text has been produced. That planning, drafting and revising and editing um, are recursive, they happen again and again, and they're potentially simultaneous. And plans and texts are constantly evaluated by the writer in a kind of feedback loop, uh, plan, write, plan, write. So the model advises teachers to assist writers um, by encouraging um, 
pre-writing tasks like brainstorming and outlining to generate ideas, to write several drafts, uh, improving each one as they go along by giving uh, feedback on drafts and encouraging peer response to writing, by delaying surface corrections, so uh, changing the organization or the grammar um, uh, at, at only at the final editing, and then publishing the work, um, sharing it with others as a poster, a class paper, a website or whatever. Now, this has been the dominant uh, model in many countries for 50 years, um, particularly strong in, in the US. But students, I think, need language support, not just writing support to overcome their problems. Getting students to reflect on how they write, I don't think is going to improve what they write. So the influence of cognitive, cognitive psychology rather than applied linguistics means that teachers are concerned with what students think about when they write rather than the language that they need to do it. And this creates four main uh, problems for teaching writing. First of all, by overemphasizing psychological factors, it neglects the importance of how context influences writing. So process focuses on the writer as an isolated individual, uh, struggling to express personal meanings. So it tends to represent writing as a decontextualized skill. There's little understanding of the ways that um, language is used in particular domains or what it means to communicate with others in writing. But in fact, we very rarely just write. Um, we always write for a purpose in a particular context. And this involves variation in the ways that we use language and the ways that we write, not universal rules. So in other words, process models don't really give us any help in understanding language, nor do they allow us to confidently advise students on their writing. The second problem is that a discovery based approach like this doesn't make the language students need explicit. They're taught the structures, um, they're not taught the structures of target text types, but are expected to discover appropriate forms in the process of writing itself or in the teacher's comments in, in, in track changes uh, on their drafts. Now, this might be fine uh, for well educated. Um, students or L1 students, but second language writers often find themselves in an invisible curriculum. And Amy Delpit puts this very well when she says, adherence to process approaches to writing creates situations in which students ultimately find themselves held accountable for knowing a set of rules about which no one has ever directly informed them. Teachers do students no service to suggest, even implicitly, that product is not important. They're gonna be judged on their product regardless of the process used to achieve it. And that product, based as it is on the specific codes of a particular culture, is more readily produced when the directives to, um, of how to produce it are made explicit. A third problem with this approach is that it, that it assumes that making the processes of expert writers explicit will make novices better writers. But not all writing is the same. Not, it doesn't always depend on an ability to use universal context independent revision and editing practices. So exam writing, for example, doesn't involve multi-draft drafting and revision. And a lot of academic and professional writing is collaborative and time constrained. So different writing, uh, kinds of writing involve uh, different kinds of process. And finally, I think um, process models disempower teachers. So this is a model of learning based on personal freedom, self-expression and learner responsibility, all of which might be crushed by too much teacher intervention. And this reduces the teacher to well-meaning bystanders. We just assign a task and give feedback later. And then because language is an organization tend to be added on to the end of the process as editing, rather than forming a central 
um, resource for constructing meanings, then students are given no way of seeing how texts are written for particular purposes and audiences. Um, this is Chris Tribble um, taking a selfie on a very bad day by looking at it. But um, he says, while a process approach will certainly make it possible for apprentice writers to become more effective at generating texts, this may be to little avail if they're not aware of what their readers expect to find in those texts. Okay, now the writer-oriented research I've been talking about sees context as the site of writing, where the writer is, what she's thinking of, and so on. A final approach expands the idea of context beyond the local situ writing situation to the reader's context, how writers think their text will be understood and what they do to address the reader. So, um, writers are encouraged to think about these kinds of questions. Who are you writing for? What's your relationship? Is it formal or informal? Uh, friendly or a stranger? What does she already know? An expert or a beginner? Um, what does uh, he or she believe? Will she understand your text? Will she agree with the ideas in it? So essentially, when we write, we choose our words to connect with others and present our ideas in ways that make most sense to them. We try and, and draw readers in to influence them, persuade them, inform them, entertain them in using a text that sees the world in the same way as them. And we do this using the words, the structures, and the kinds of argument that they're going to expect and understand. So a reader-oriented view emphasizes the interaction between writers and readers. The process of writing here involves creating a text that the writer assumes the reader will recognize and expect. And the process of reading involves drawing on assumptions about what the writer is trying to do. Um, you know, we've known this for years. This is called coherence in, in linguistics. Now it's the unfamiliarity of these expectations um, which is one reason why writing in English is so difficult for speakers of other languages, because what's seen as logical, engaging, relevant, coherent, all vary across different cultures. Culture isn't the only explanation, of course, but it's clear there are different ways of organizing ideas and structuring arguments in different languages. So research shows, for example, that compared with many languages, academic texts in English at a register level um, tend to be more explicit about their structure and purposes. They employ more and more recent citations. They use fewer rhetorical questions than students like. They're less tolerant of digressions. Uh, they're more cautious in making claims. They have stricter conventions for uh, subsections and headings. And they use more sentence connectors, therefore, however, um, on the other hand, and so on. Now, because of this, EAP teachers spend a lot of time focusing on the ways which uh, help students to do this, teaching things like nominalization, impersonalization, sentence connectives, hedging, meta discourse, and so on. Now, Michael Klein suggests that we can trace these features to the fact that English makes the writer responsible for clarity. So in some traditions of writing, um, I think German, Korean, Finnish, Chinese, it's the writer who, it's the reader who makes a text clear. The writer complements the reader by not spelling everything out. But in English, the writer has to set things out uh, clearly so it can be easily understood. And I know that my Hong Kong students got uh, uh, sick of what they saw as a repetition. Um, say what you're going to say, say it, and then say what you've said. It seems too much. But considering readers then largely means um, looking at how writing is used by social groups. And the idea of discourse community is important here as a way of joining text writers and readers together. Now, discourse community is a fuzzy idea, um, but it helps to 
show us something of how writing is works in different uh, disciplines and different workplaces. It tells us, for example, that needs analysis is important and uh, because different disciplines value different kinds of argument and set different writing tasks. So in the humanities and social sciences, for example, analyzing and synthesizing from multiple sources is an important skill, whereas in the sciences and engineering uh, and technology, activity-based skills like um, describing procedures, defining objects and planning solutions are needed. Um, perhaps at the most obvious uh, level of community difference is Lexis. This um, slide shows the most common content words taken from uh, chapters in five first year university linguistics books and five from uh, biology. And um, we can see that the disciplines have completely ways, different ways of talking about the world and students need to learn completely different vocabularies. Less obviously, um, a study of an academic corpus of four million words that Polly Tse and I did a few years ago um, showed that the so-called universal items, semi-technical items in Coxhead's academic word list actually have widely different frequencies and preferred meanings in different fields. So consist means stay the same in the social sciences and composed of in the sciences. Volume means book in applied linguistics and quantity in biology. And abstract means remove in engineering and theoretical in the social sciences. So they're polysemous words and words which seem to be the same have different meanings across fields. Words can also be uh, misleading um, in, in technical context. Althea Haar and I looked at a large corpus of uh, words from economics and finance and identified over 830 words which had a meaning specific to economic and finance. Although many of them also had a general meaning at all, like um, asset, risk, interest and income. But they had a far more specific word uh, meaning in the um, discipline. We also know that different uh, fields make use of different genres. So that in their large scale corpus study of 30 disciplines in UK universities, Nessie and Gardner found 13 different genre families ranging from design specifications, research reports, explanations um, through to um, uh, critiques which differ considerably in their social purpose, their genre structure, and the networks that they form with other genres. Even in closely related fields, um, students are given very, very different assignments. So Jimenez found that nursing and midwifery students write very different uh, assignments. So we can uh, see that there was very little overlap there. Now, um, in teaching, a reader-oriented uh, approach suggests using rhetorical consciousness raising um, means to um, help students to understand the text that they have to deal with and write. And basically the idea is to encourage students to think about uh, their own writing and to how, help them to see how language is actually used by analysing text. Now there are various ways of doing this. Um, uh, getting students to look at corpora is, is uh, uh, increasingly important. Um, and, um, but I just want to mention two here, portfolios and reader analysis, just to wrap up. Um, so Anne Johns you advi um, advises using mixed genre portfolios. So these are where students are asked to write um, a range of different genres during a course, say an argument essay, research-based assignment, the summary, collect them together for assessment in a folder at the end of the course, together with a commentary on each one. So, um, and then at the uh, end of the course, um, uh, students can reflect on the differences. Uh, this is an example um, actually taken from um, uh, a secondary school in Singapore that 
and Johns was involved with. And um, so the commentary can encourage students to ask questions like, why did you organize the essay in this way? What, what parts of it do you like best? What difficulties did you um, have in writing it? What did you learn from it? So the portfolio doesn't just give us as teachers uh, a, a more accurate picture of, of students writing and what they can do, but it also has a consciousness raising function. It, getting students to think about the similarities and the differences between genres and how language can be used to achieve these rhetorical goals. Finally, we can encourage students to think about their readers, um, interviewing proficient users of a genre, like their, their content tutors, for example, about their own writing. Or perhaps more realistically in many contexts, teachers can encourage their students to think about who their readers are and what they need from a text. So this simple checklist can help sensitize students to the importance of thinking about shared knowledge. So this is an example um, of a response to a letter of complaint, but it can be adapted for any, any kind of uh, text. Okay, that's brought me to the end. Um, I've tried to cover the major frameworks that are used to look at writing and at the same time to argue that writing isn't just words on a page or on a screen, um, nor is it the activity of isolated individuals. It's always a social practice influenced by cultural and institutional context. Now, what this means for teachers is that we need as far as possible, I think, to become researchers of the text our students will um, need and the context in which they're likely to need them. And then through our classroom activities, to make these features to these of these texts as explicit as we possibly can. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hyland, for sharing with us uh, the you. three different orientations of text writer and reading in teaching writing. Uh, we have some time for questions now, so I would like to open the floor to questions from the attendees. Uh, you can either ask the question directly or put it in the chat or use the chat function. Hello. Okay, anything. I can go home. I can I start home. us off. Um, I can into it. Sort of a kind of a random question. I like the way you sorted things and I've never kind of really thought about the different ways we teach in quite that way. So I think that was really helpful. Um, I'd love to think that like, I do a combination of those things in our <laughs> courses, but I don't know. Um, and I mean, I definitely, you know, I taught most of my uh, academic writing was in the United States and I'm definitely sort of have a bias towards that process writing approach. Um, mm. So I think it's, a bit more, I think there's more to it than than what was represented, but of course you can't represent it all. But I was, curious, mm. I feel like more and more, um, at least in the US when I talked to a lot of people and I think this was this slightly informed the course that we designed here at NTU for all the first year students was some of the thinking of it was about um, instilling in students habits of thinking because it's, for every single discipline, right? We have all the students all mixed together. So we really can't be necessarily teaching them discipline specific moves. Um, but instead we try to instill in them habits of thinking, which might be, uh, you know, you know, they, they, they find a topic and like go find a place in Singapore and observe it, right? So kind of just being curious and um, observant, like not judging to a, not jumping to an argument or a particular judgment about something, but sitting there and really, um, really observing it closely, taking your time to take field notes and then kind of analyzing the details and sticking with the concrete before you go and jump to some sort of argument or idea. Um, so that's like one example, which is sort of like a curiosity, but also sticking with evidence before you jump to some sort of conclusion. Um, it, it's a pretty cognitive approach though, isn't it? I mean, I think that's that's mm -hmm. pretty much 
um, a process approach that you're yeah. asking students to focus on um, uh, content and reflecting on on that content. They're not. Um, I mean, what I think. I, th I think you're right. I mean, I, I represented um, process very negatively because I think it did come out, you know, Flower and Hayes and uh, so forth are all um, uh, really cognitive people. And they saw the importance of um, uh, how you how you um, generate ideas and how you critique those ideas. But it doesn't give the language to critique things in a way which would be acceptable um, in a particular context. You know, uh, the ways mm -hmm. that you critique in uh, sociology are going to be very different to engineering, biology and so forth. So um, you, you can, you know, critical thinking, I, I would have thought, involves um, a lot of um, uh, understanding of how language works. So you know, I, I can see that, you know, what you're trying to do, but is it not um, um, uh, worthwhile to get students to think critically about the use of language, not just the situation that they're observing? Because they might get um, ideas for, for writing, but they don't know how to write those ideas down effectively um, without help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they do eventually go find sources and and there is definitely a, a sort of a critical engagement with their sources and the ideas of their sources and um, thinking about language in that way. But it is, and this could also just be our, our typical Singaporean student is really a very bilingual, trilingual, um, mm. you know, uh, I consider our students first language speakers for the most part. Um, yeah. So I, I don't focus as much on language in, in, I don't feel like I need to introduce them to what academic language sounds like. I think they're there already for that. But uh, anyway, I, but this, is, this is really you may be You, you yeah. may be well, well be right. Um, but, um, you know, I, you know, the, the, the writing of chemical engineering is nobody's first language. You know, I, I could not hope to, to, to put together a, um, um, a research essay or report in a discipline I'm not familiar with the language of. So it, it's essentially, you know, that that is throwing me in cold. I'm a native speaker of English, I'm a, 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 an educated person, but I, I, I would be out of my depths uh, being asked to, to write in a, uh, a field that I, I had no un understanding of. I mean, it might, might well be that, that in, getting your students to reflect on the sources that they're learning something about the um, the way that arguments are constructed. But, I, you know, I, I just feel that there's a way of short circuit, shortcutting that um, that process and giving them ways of um, of critiquing um, those arguments. You know, what how do these arguments work? Yeah. Not just not just why is this a bad idea, but mm -hmm. um, how can we uh, um, critique those arguments by looking at the way that they're constructed? And, you know, it's, and, and in that way, we we don't just um, uh, fill our students heads with these with these recipes for writing genres. We 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 we're encouraging them to think about. Uh, the prestigious writing in particular fields um, as they as 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 they're learning uh, the field. I mean, if, for me, um, um, learning a discipline is learning the the writing of that discipline. That you mm -hmm. can't you can't separate the two. And um, and so I would, you know, which is why at Hong Kong U, um, you know, uh, those years ago, we we put together these this this register-wide um, academic writing program and then <clears throat> um, uh, showed how this varied by, by looking at, at different programs. Um, so the students are immersed in the language of the discipline while they're immersed in the discipline. Because yeah. I don't think the um, subject teachers really help students with their, with their writing or they, they see um, you know, they, they, they see the English language of their students as, as good, they see they can write, but they don't think that, um, okay, well, this is, this, is, um, this is not just a top up 
for uh, um, general language English, in general English, it's a um, it's it's a new kind of literacy where you have to uh, use language in specific ways to be effective. So that that you know that's my view anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions for uh, Dr. Highland? Uh, okay, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Oh, wonderful. Hi. Thank you so much, Dr. Highland. This is very useful. I, I have Thank a related you. question. Um, I'm wondering to what extent we should model bad writing for kids. So, or, or, or adults. I mean, even for adults, it's very important. So I'm wondering whether from the get-go, we should, you know, for example, show them what doesn't work as a piece of metafiction, or should we let them discover this through trial and error? Yeah, that's nice. That's a that's a nice um, question. I I've never thought about that. Um, do you do that? I know. Um, <laughs> so I've I've taught young students, and sometimes mm. I model. Um, and currently, I'm a creative writing student, so I'm just kind of seeing things from both perspectives. Mm. Mm. I mean, I I. <sighs> It might, it might be better to give them good examples of writing and ask them to critique it. Um, <laughs> but because um, that's what they're going to come across. But I mean, there's a lot of bad writing out there. You know, there's a lot of bad published writing, too. But um, I think the a problem with um, with critiquing writing and learning to write uh, in specific context is identifying what it is that the students need to write. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if they're at um, high school, um, probably they're, you know, what would be useful is is, is how to write um, essays and the kind of text that they need to pass the exams to get to university. Um, but once they're at university, then they, um, they, they find themselves in a different situation where the kind of language that they're familiar with from school, from home, and other um, situations um, is is not enough. You know, they're throwing they're being thrown into a, a new literacy context where um, the, which uses an alien language. You know, I um, so. I think if we can identify the kind of language, the kind of writing that students have to do, then we should um, uh, make that kind of writing explicit, see what the problems are, see what the uh, options for variation are, and so on. Um, the idea of bad writing, though, is, is, is not a bad one, but I, I think a lot of academics write very badly anyway. So you you could probably um, <laughs> you could probably find that. I mean, they do. They they write to obscure ideas. You know. I mean, if, I don't know if you've ever read any postmodern um, sociologists um, or philosophers. I mean, they're impenetrable. I mean, what's the point of writing in a way that nobody can understand you? Um, you know, I, I I I think to be effective, the first thing you have to be is to be accessible. And and that's different for different audiences. Okay. Thanks very much for your question. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you. Can can I ask you a question while we wait for others? Uh, so <laughs> of what kind what kind of a model are you recommending? Are you suggesting that we we um, use an eclectic approach that we should uh, uh, we should actually combine uh, the three approaches in our teaching of, um, you know, writing rather than just sticking with one approach, because each approach has certain limitations. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think, um, you know, as been mentioned that, that there is a, a certain amount of um, mix and match. I think the process approach, for example, has incorporated ideas about reader awareness. Um, um, particularly in university contexts, um, and that the genre approaches often use redrafting and peer re peer editing and so forth. So, so there is overlap. Um, but I guess the, um, the the important thing is really to to try and understand what it is your students need to do, you know, um, what are the texts that they have to read and write, and then um, try and identify what is 
you know, how those texts were organized, what is what are the salient features of those texts, and then um, find ways to make those students uh, familiar with those um, those ways of writing. Um, yeah, so it 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 I think a, a, a mix, but 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 with very much or reader awareness, audience awareness um, is, is important for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I teach this uh, thesis writing course. Mm. And I do use the genre approach with them because mm. students find it very useful. But then yeah. to talk to them about the constraints of a genre approach. And um, I, what I get them to do is um, I get them to download a thesis um, in their discipline. And then after having given them some input about the genre itself of, say, writing an introduction, I get them to apply those information elements to the sample thesis to see mm. how similar things are in their discipline and how, uh, if there are variations, we have a discussion in class about those variations. Um, and I get them to think about why, you know, the texts in their discipline are different from those in others. So that's yeah. the way, you know, I deal with the criticism yeah. uh, related to, you know, the constraining aspect of genre yeah. analysis. I mean, I, I think that's great. I mean, but I mean, genres do constrain us. You know, you can't write a, 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 a thesis in applied linguistics in a way that someone might write it in another discipline. Um, we did something similar. Um, Lillian Wong had a, um, a project where she um, created a, a corpus of um, highly rated PhDs in all 10 faculties across the university and uh, students had access to that corpus and they wrote a, um, um, uh, a, 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 a query program where the students could interrogate the corpus, they could look for salient things and they had um, uh, feedback in uh, diagrammatically so they could see frequency charts and this sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, this idea of contrasting um, how things are done in different fields is, I mean, that was um, championed by, by John Swales, um, who uh, um, I think in, in that um, academic writing for graduate students, I don't know if you know that textbook with, by Swales and Feek, Yes, it's yes. Full of tasks like that. Um, that. Yeah, I mean that is the, the, the greatest book ever written, I think. Um, but it's um, uh, it, it it's very very useful. It's full of ideas in how to exploit corpus data for consciousness raising, and um, I've used it, and and students really um, do appreciate, you know, seeing how how very different things are. That there's not just one. Uh, uh, constrained, rigid approach to doing things that, that mm -hmm. uh, things are done differently, and which which shows a certain you know flexibility in how how they can do it. Yeah, no, that sounds That's an interesting good. course that you've got. Yeah. I really enjoy teaching it because there's a lot of discussion, and we have um, you know consultation sessions uh, yeah. with individual students. So it's a very satisfying course. Anyway, I think there's it's Fantastic. Yeah, because I mean, in the past, students didn't get that kind of help. You know, they saw their supervisor and they went away and, and wrote their thesis. But now there are courses like that, which are, you know, invaluable for, for, for graduate students. Yeah. And there's a question for you uh, in the chat. It's from uh, Dylan. Uh, okay. he, do you want to read it or should I read um, it out to you? OK, you can read. Re so he says can... reader approach. How would you structure an ESL class for this? It sounds like it'll be heavily vocabulary based. Um, I don't know why you think it should be very vocabulary based. Um, uh, it's, um, it's not just a question of what vocabulary the, the reader will be aware of, but the kind of argument structures, the kinds of uh, familiar uh, lexical bundles um, and grammar patterns that that are involved. So um, yeah, I don't think Lexis is a um, a, a particular um, um, uh, heavy area of emphasis in in um, in that. Um, how would I structure a, an EL cell class for this? Well, I would I would do it starting with. Um, 
thinking about genre. I think everything starts with genre for me and how, um, you know, at the, at the beginning at, at that, at that early stage, the first stage of genre teaching, getting the students to think about, you know, what is the context of this? Who is the who is the reader? Um, what do they know? What do they need to know? Um, do they know more than you? Are they a novice or are they um, are they an expert? Um, and then, um, uh, so starting with the reader, and then um, in a, in a kind of top down way building a, uh, a, a a text that will address the readers the readers needs and i think i mean one of the problems is for for efl uh learners is is identifying who the reader is you know we often give them um uh crazy readers you know a, a, an american businessman is a reader now what does a student know about an american businessman not very much so um giving them realistic readers uh you know other students or students from another country perhaps or students from another school or um uh um students from another discipline i mean how can you um make ideas uh coherent and plausible and effective for that audience um we wrote a paper um, a couple of years ago on how academics translate ideas that they've written in research articles into blogs and exactly the same writers exactly the same content and um, how they restructured and rewrote it for a general um, audience that were not specialists in in the field um, and we've also done the same thing for um, uh, three minute theses which are you know really popular now but how do you convince or persuade a um, a general uh non-specialist audience to um to agree with you or to at least be persuaded by things that you have to say and it it's it's done through the use of careful choices of language so the same content can be said in in different ways for different purposes thanks thanks for your question Dylan. okay while we wait for more questions i have another question for you um, Relate it to audience. Can I uh, sure cut in with that? Sorry, just because it's relevant to the audience kind of yeah, issue. Because okay. uh, I was reading this article. It's an old article, I think, by Peter Elbow called um, like something like "Closing My Eyes When I Speak," um, mm -hmm. and his his basic argument is that audience thinking too much of audience, like because there was this big push about like audience awareness, gotta like pay attention to your reader. Who's your reader? You know, working mm -hmm. for, always having that in mind. Um, but he was arguing that when you're first trying to draft something, that it's actually better to put the audience aside and really just kind of get the ideas on the page that thinking too early of audience basically can hinder, uh, especially for a student, if they're thinking of a, uh, like a teacher. But, you know, even if we're, we're too worried about the conventions and the way we're going to cater to this audience, it can actually keep us from really just getting our ideas out there and, and thinking freely and, and exploring mm. ideas. Just, I mean, yeah, I mean, thinking, thinking freely. I mean, this egocentric way of, of starting a text, I'm wondering what kind of text you're thinking of. I mean, I, I assume that you're thinking about creative writing, about no, um, literary I'm thinking, text. I'm thinking about just kind of boring academic writing, right? About like, you know, being feeling like you can take risks and explore a bit when you're criticizing a text or when you're trying to get your ideas, uh, not an argument out on the page. Um, mm. And I, I'm basically, I'm just wondering if audience has a time and place, right? But maybe it's not for initial drafting, but maybe for so you, later. You start revision. with start by writing for yourself mm. and then rewrite it for somebody else. I don't, yeah. I don't really see how that works. I don't see how you can. You can have ideas that are not related to the outside world. I mean, what what is the point of having ideas? I mean, if you, I mean, I, I'm thinking of, of you know literature as well. P people who write. Um, um, I'm reading a lot of Kate Atkinson at the moment, who, who's a brilliant writer, but she clearly thinks about you know the effect of her words on others, and it's not being constrained by convention. It's it's I think. 
um, how can I write this in a way that is going to move people or make them laugh or, you know, um, it, it's, it's not just about um, the ideas, it's about the effect of the ideas. And I, I don't really see, you know, unless you're writing a shopping list, you've got to be thinking about other people. This yeah. is this is my view. You know, it's um, this this kind of egocentric writing. You know, it, it it might be okay in psychoanalysis, but I don't think it's. It, I think you have to think about communication, and and mm. the job of teachers is to help students communicate. Um, and uh, you know that that. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm I I, I know Peter Elboy's work, and I I got a lot of respect for him, and he, he he's a man that has. Um, that is very, very focused all his career. He had, you know, fantastic ideas about writing. Um, but I, you know, I, this is just my humble opinion. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Thanks, Angela. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let me ask you my question then while we wait. Um, it's about digital genres. Um, they pose a challenge for genre theory, don't they? So um, why? That's because there's a lot of, even in three empty uh, presentations, uh, it's not like a simple genre. It's a mix of different genres. It's academic plus there's a promotional aspect as well that is taken into consideration and it impacts the genre. So what kind so of that's, that's a that's a personal opinion, right? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, actually, I, I, I read some all papers. Genres have, all genres have a have a promotional aspect. You know, when I when you think about, I mean, we've done some studies recently on hype, um, and particularly on hyping of scientific research. And over the last fifty years, this has increased hugely. That the writers are presenting their research in a way which is designed to um, uh, promote that that research, yeah, not just present it. Well, definitely there are promotional aspects of an academic writing. I agree with that. Mm. But uh, what about, you know, things like genre boundaries and so on? Because in digital genres, uh, there seems to be like an amalgamation of different genres. Uh, and it's difficult to tell where one genre begins and another one ends. Um, so, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, uh, genres are not fixed, they change. Um, yeah. And typically when a genre m moves to a new medium, I mean, when we started writing, you know, move from business letters to business emails and, and, and friendly letters to, to friendly emails, then the the genre had some of those characteristics, but those they generally they they gradually change. Um, I so I don't, I don't think there are fixed boundaries, are there? I mean, the, because something is written electronically rather than on paper it doesn't make it necessarily um, a, 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 it doesn't undermine the idea of genre. No, no, I'm not saying it undermines it. I'm just saying that it has implications for the way we understood what genre theory was all about. So well, I think it I think it 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 expands our um you know it's great for researchers because it expands our our, our palette of uh, genres to analyze. You know, um the 3MT is a is a uh, a genre. Um and just because it has um uh it, it it's taking um uh material from a, a thesis and trying to compress it and making it uh, make it available to a general non-specialist audience makes it a very interesting genre doesn't mean to say that it's not it's not a genre no 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 i'm not saying it's not a genre it is a genre I'm not but sure what you mean um, evolved over time what happens is when genres have I'm just talking about the impact of it on genre theory. So for instance, I'm talking about evolution, about new genres and how you know they develop. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of genre mixing and so on. Uh, it, it, you know, and once mm. there's genre mixing, then they evolve into uh, you know new genres. 
So mm. I, I was just asking you this question about how have you done any research in the digital genres and how they've impacted uh, genre theory itself? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I know that Vijay is a big proponent of genre mixing. I don't, this is not something I agree with myself. Um, I think that, that, that genres have elements of other genres in them, and this is the way that they change. But I, I, I don't really think it's, it's, it's mixing or blending, you know, the kind of things that Vijay talks about. Um, yeah, we've looked at blogs, we've looked at websites, uh, 3MTs, um, online reviews. Um, we've looked at a lot of uh, genres, um, not in, in terms of its impact on genre theory. Um, you know, I, I'm not that interested in genre theory. I'm, I'm kind yeah. of interested in, in, you know, what people do with, with, with language when they write. Um, I mean, maybe it does have uh, an implications for how genres change, um, but um, you know, genres tend to emerge from older genres. They don't come out of thin air. You know, a three MT is a, is based on a thesis. It has some uh, something there that that um, the content is represented in a different way and um i think that's what's interesting about it you know how do we take content that has been presented in one way like a research article and then use to um uh to reach a wider audience or different audience in a blog or a 3mt um and that can tell us something about you know audience about writing about uh communities and, and i guess about genres as well um but yeah, I mean, it's an exciting time because we've got a lot, a lot of extra genres we can we can study and talk about. Yeah, but I, I got no idea what it means for genre theory. <laughs> that's the, you you write that up. Yeah, that's your next paper. <laughs> uh, I don't think there are any more questions. So should we wrap it up? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you very much to the attendees for their questions and for Dr. Highland, you know, for responding to these questions. And thank you again for your talk. Um, and on that note, I'd like to wrap up today's session. Uh, bye, everybody, and have a good week ahead. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.